Good morning, everybody. Are you ready for the Word of God? Yes, we're in a series called Faith Over Fear, and we're kind of landing this plane. So last, uh, next week, we're, we're going to have last uh, part of this series. Uh, did you enjoy this so far? Yes. All right. Today, I think you're really going to enjoy it, or maybe feel awkward. I don't know. But the topic today is faith of a prostitute. Okay, faith of a prostitute. When we, re when we read the Bible, um, it uh, introduces all kinds of people. And most of them we put on a pedestal. Most of them we say, oh, be like this guy, like this person. But then we come to this one scripture where it says, by faith, Rahab the prostitute. And she's put in a hall of fame, in a hall of faith. She's one of the heroes of faith in the Bible. Through her... Um, Jesus Christ was born, so she's a great-great-grandma of David, and then Jesus Christ as well. So Son of God came from that lineage, and she is in the Bible. Not an not a easy topic to talk about, so um, if you want to put your kids in um, day, uh, kids' church, that would be great as well. <laughs> Amen. But we've been talking about faith in this series. What is faith? Faith is a gift of God to each poor person born to this planet Earth. Okay? Um, just like you were born with ability to love, you can choose not to love, but you have the choice to love. If you don't love anybody, maybe you're a narcissist or maybe you're a psychopath, hope not. All of us are a little bit narcissistic, I, I always say. Um, <laughs> but if, if, if you are, at least you love yourself in some twisted, uh, wicked type of a way. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I'm going to fall off my bed and hurt myself or hit my head on a, a little thing, nightstand, just to hurt myself because I hate myself. No, we all love ourselves, take care of ourselves, feed ourselves. You all look good today. And that means you love yourself. Amen. You brushed your teeth. You brushed your hair. You put makeup on. That's for women, okay? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Amen. But just like you were born with, uh, you, just like you were born with love, ability to love, you can choose to love or not, you were born with ability of hope. Today you might be going through something hard in your life and you can choose to have great hope that God will take me through this. I can do this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or you can choose not to have hope today. You can lose hope. And often people lose hope. You were born with faith just like that. When St. Paul talks about these three great abilities that God has given us, he says, and now abide these three. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You know that children were born with love? Children were born with faith. Often Jesus would point to the children and say, if you had faith like a child. See, that proves my point. That children are born with faith. And often they use it a lot. Have you ever seen a 10-year-old girl have faith for an iPhone? <laughs> my God, a 10-year-old will do anything to get an iPhone. She will go to her mom. If mom says no to her dad, if dad says no to her grandparents, if grandparents say no, she will find a way into your room at night, unplug your phone, either play right by your bed, where it freaks you out when you get up to go to the bathroom, or she'll take it to her room, and then in the morning you find her, how late did you stay up, honey? She can't get up to school anymore because she's been on a phone talking to her cousin, per se. <laughs> Allegedly, okay? <laughs> Children are born with faith. You are born with faith. But then here's something happens. When we, get out, when we get a little older, we start talking about reality. Yeah, this is this faith tie, the stuff you talk about in church, but this is real life. And we stop using our faith. And that displeases our creator God because God has given you that ability he wants you to grow it mm -hmm. yeah. he doesn't want you to stop at when you're a kid stop using your faith to get an iPhone he wants you to continue to grow and keep going and be mighty men and women of faith Amen. you were born with it never forget it 
Otherwise, why would Jesus rebuke his disciples for not having enough faith or not choosing to believe? He's like, guys, turn on your faith engines. Turn on your faith. Or he would encourage them, love one another, love one another. Turn on your love. You can choose to practice faith or not. Faith, what is faith? And here's how I describe it. Faith is the power either of the soul or of the spirit or both. It's the power of the soul. It's the power of the heart. Faith is a spiritual force that is activate, that, that when you activate it, it makes you work. It makes you do something. It, it, comes, it produces some kind of actions behind it. Faith is the servant of your heart. Many of you know this verse in the Bible in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 4. It says this, God has made everything beautiful in its time. And he has put what? Eternity in their heart. But they can never understand this eternity because your mind cannot understand eternity. So how do you get it? How do you get this thing that God put inside you? By faith. God has made everything beautiful and he has put faith. When it says eternity, and that includes faith. Whatever else it is, it's more than that. But God has put eternity inside of your heart. And yet you can never understand that eternity. So you must receive it by faith. You have faith. We just don't use faith. And then faith is just laying dormant as a seed. It's dormant and then it doesn't have opportunity to grow. Faith and doubt cannot coexist. F doubt is the kryptonite to your faith. Jesus said, if you believe and not doubt, you can say to this mountain, be moved. And this mountain will be moved. He said, you don't even need a great faith. You just need a size of a mustard seed. Imagine having two horses, equal power. One is a faith horse and one is a doubt horse. And they're roped together between them. And faith tries to take off this way. But then doubt is pushing this way. And they're equal. How far is your faith going? Nowhere. Nowhere. So you got to cut doubt loose. You got to remove doubt. Because doubt is a kryptonite. It, re it stops faith working in your life. And so, but you don't get to a place overnight just by... Um, that's it. Today I'm going to choose to believe and like in a moment everything will happen. You have to grow in your faith. God is constantly building your faith. Today, faith comes from hearing the word of God. And today's story, I believe, is going to bless you. Now, faith and fear have a lot in common. Faith is that conviction that God is going to make something good happen in your life. Fear is the conviction that something bad is going to happen today. People of faith, here's your opportunity. Every morning you have an opportunity to get up and practice your faith. You can get up and say, this is a great day. Today I'm going to have to overcome some challenges. But I'm looking forward to it. Right. How many of you know today you're going to have to overcome some challenges? Faith says, okay. That's how we grow stronger. Fear on the other hand. Says, so stay in bed. You got 16 more hours and you can sleep again. <laughs> right? Because fear is always like, don't get out of bed. It's going to be bad today. And every excuse not to. That's not the kind of life Jesus Christ came to give you. He came to give you a life to the fullest. And that means you got to get up in the morning and gotta, you got to look forward with joy. Hey, God, what do you have for me today? There's going to be some good. There's going to be some bad. But the bad is what makes me stronger. It's the hard things in my life that grow my faith. Faith says that with God, all things are possible. Fear says you can't do that. If you believe you can't do it, I guarantee you, you can't do it. But if you believe that you can do it, somehow, someway, eventually, you will get it done. Okay, um, and faith uh, uh, says, um, faith and fear both demand that you believe in something you cannot see. 
Faith activates power of God, and fear activates the power of the evil one. Faith and fear are self-fulfilling prophecies. Fear is self-made prison, and faith is what sets you free. Some of you cannot get up in the morning because it's just going to be another bad day. That's a self-made prison. Faith says, I got to get up because I got to live this life because God is not done with me yet. When he's done with me, then I will be done. Okay, then he won't need me here. Amen. So you got to get up every day and, and live by faith. And here's the good news. Faith pleases God. Abraham was a man of faith. So was Rahab the prostitute. I want us to open our Bibles today to Hebrews chapter 11, 30, verse 31, and then uh, uh, Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. And so we're going to read these two verses today. And I want you to read it with me, just the first phrase. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city. Welcome to the spies. But notice these words. It was by faith Rahab. So Hebrews chapter 11 is a chapter of heroes of faith. It talks about these great men like Enoch, like Noah, like uh, Abel, like Abraham and Sarah. It talks about these. But then it puts a Rahab in there. It's like, really, God? But she is... One of the heroes. Imagine going to a museum and you see George Washington and Lincoln and all these great people. Trump. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I had to wake you up, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, and then you see a prostitute, a madam. Is that what you call her? You know, the woman of the evening, the woman of the night, you know. And here she's between and you're like, what is she doing? Here, take her out. And that's how we sometimes feel. But God in his wisdom decided to put this woman there. Yeah. So what did she do? Well, she saved the lives of spies. But more than that, she believed God. Let's open to Joshua chapter 2 and another verse. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a... <laughs> it's like, what? I used to read it. It's like, okay, whatever. But now I'm like reading with adult mind. It's like, what is happening here? So the two men set out. And as soon as they crossed into the enemy territory, they go into a house of a prostitute named Rahab and stay there a night. What? That doesn't look right in a Bible. By faith. By faith, this... But I got to give you a backstory. I want you to understand this because what is it that made Rahab one of the unlikely but heroes of faith? Let me give you a backstory. So Joshua is called to lead people of Israel to the promised land. Moses started the journey. He led people out of Egypt, but never finished. So Joshua now comes in and I don't know why, but maybe because of a little bit of doubt in Joshua's heart, Joshua sends the spies there. Didn't we learn that nothing good happened last time they sent spies? Last time Moses sent, 40 years ago, Moses sent um, 12 spies. And they came and brought bad report. Well, now Joshua only sends two. He's like, we'll have better results. But still, is it, God already promised that I'm going to lead you into this land. Yeah. But maybe faith works. Maybe generals, they're supposed to know information. That they're supposed to know where the gates are. They're supposed to know things. Maybe it's fine. But Joshua sends these spies, and as soon as they cross the river, as soon as they enter into enemy territory, they go into a house of a prostitute. And I've read many commentary on this, and I've asked my wife this week. I said, honey, um, what do you, why do you think they would go there? Uh, it's like, why? A house of a prostitute. What is happening here? And Tanya said, well, because probably in a red district, it's easier to blend in and to hide because everybody is hiding there. And I was like, you're so smart. Thank you for sharing me with that point. And then I ran with this story. Like, why would they go there? And, but then I kept reading this story about this encounter. 
And I realized that uh, there was a lot of wisdom to it. I don't think they came there for sex. I think they came there for something else. If you want to blend in in a city, if you want to hear pillow talk, if you want to go to somebody who knows all the information, you go to the, to the house. Especially in those days, right? That's where the news was. Why? Because uh, uh, even in movies, if you watch uh, old movies, right? Uh, where do these politicians go to have this uh, private uh, uh, conversation? They go to a whorehouse. Think about it. And so these men, I think, at first I was like, are these men holy or are these men foolish? Are they going there for sex or are they going there for information? Well, and, and after just look, looking at this story for a while, I, I saw that they're going there for information. They're different than the rest of the people. True. Because Rahab does not betray them. If they came there for services, after services are done, both people are ashamed. And so I don't think Ahab... Uh, Rahab. <laughs> I don't think Rahab would have a problem turning him in. Because next day, the king found out that spies are in the city. How did they find out? Because there was other uh, men in that house. Can I present to you an idea that Rahab was not just a simple prostitute. She was the, the boss prostitute. She was the one who had a house. of. She, she was a businesswoman. I never saw that before. Because later, if you study this, she is doing business with, she's making a deal with the two spies. That's interesting. What do men go for to a prostitute's house? I mean, to, to fulfill their lusts. I feel dirty even talking about this in church. I mean, but we're, we're going we're gonna to get through this, I, I promise, really quickly. I just want to show you that this is the oldest profession, and this is the dirtiest profession, in my opinion. Okay? But what do men go there for? For services. But how is it that they struck a conversation about God there? That gives me a clue. Because now she starts talking about all of us in the city. I want to show you this. I want to show you in Joshua chapter 2, verse 10, what she says to them. You wouldn't have a conversation like that if you came and, you know, yeah, you would only have a conversation. And what's, what made her um, uh, single them out and even want to talk to them because they didn't came for. They came to gain information. That's why she's talking to them like this. And here's what she says. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. So this is her. This happened 40 years. I don't think she's 40 years old. So she heard it somewhere else. But she's saying it. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. So she's telling them what she knows about them. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. That's what enemy wants to do to you. Melt your hearts in fear. Because then no one has the courage to fight you after hearing such things. For the Lord your God, I love this. This is her, I think this is the verse that makes her a hero of faith. For the Lord your God is a supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. And then she says, I want to be a part of it. If you let me live, I know. Let me show you one more word, verse. But if you let me live, okay, I want to be a part of it. I'll save your life if you let me, let me live. Now swear to me. See, I told you she's a businesswoman. Look at this. <laughs> swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee. She's talking like a banker here or a lawyer. I need some surety. I need some guarantee for your loan, right? <laughs> Next verse, last verse, 13. When Jericho is conquered, stop. What did she just say? When? when? Not if. When, right. 
Who speaks when, uh, when not if? Faith. Faith speaks when, when I'm healed, when I'm financially free, when I'm married, when I have children, when I have a house, when God blesses me, I know he will. It's just a matter of time. That's how faith speaks. Fear says, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know if I believe. I don't know. God honors faith. He comes to help people of faith. He rests upon the people of faith. He gives power to the people of faith. He honors. It pleases him. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He, it shows you that he wasn't righteous. But it was counted to him as righteousness. He was, he's a liar. He had issues, right? But look at this. I'm telling you, she's a woman of faith. She's also a businesswoman. When Jericho is conquered, you will let me live alone with my father hold on i thought prostitutes don't have family i i thought prostitutes were you know orphans or you know hate their family no that, that's not the situation here she has a father and mother my brothers and sisters who are married and all there looks like a good support system why is she that's another question why is she a prostitute well, I, I had to Google it. I had to. I went and Google why people, because uh, we're fighting sex trafficking. There's people in our church who are fighting sex trafficking. We're all for it. I've been invited to go to, um, to uh, where, where there's uh, um, strippers and stuff, but I said, no, <laughs> that's not my ministry. <laughs> like to go save strippers. I'm like, nah, I'm not ready yet, the Lord. <laughs> but... Um, uh, but I know some women here from the church who went, and th that's the ministry they've done, okay, is to, to go to those uh, um, houses, okay? And um, what was I saying? <laughs> totally lost that. I Googled it. That's right. I was like, <laughs> thank you. Somebody's listening. <laughs> I Googled why people become prostitutes. And I was shocked. There was like 10 reasons. Well, obviously, one is that um, drug addictions, um, people running away from broken homes, sexual um, uh, uh, abuse in the home as a childhood, so the girls run away. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, they've been kidnapped, okay, from another country, or they came to America. This happens a lot to uh, people from Eastern Euro Europe going to the Western Europe or to the West, and uh, peop uh, these pimps take their passports, and they said, you have to work it off, but they never really work it off, and they give them drugs and things like that, so that's sex trafficking. We have to fight it. We have to, you know, obviously uh, stand against that. And Bible says if uh, uh, kidnapping is one of the worst sins in the Bible because it's a, it, it comes with a death penalty. The Bible says if you find a man who has kidnapped another, uh, you immediately will put him to death. Okay, so that's death penalty in the Bible because kidnapping is such an evil, you know, uh, rape and kidnapping is such an evil sin. Uh, but um, there's, uh, for example, we heard, Tanya and I heard a story from a missionary uh, from Thailand area, right? Thailand? Or, yeah. yeah, somewhere up there. When a family has a um, big family, uh, sometimes uh, mom and dad, like a father, would send his daughter into a big city and uh, into business, that business, so she could send money back to support the family. And that's almost normal in, in, in some of those countries. So maybe they needed money. Why was she a prostitute? Why was Rahab the prostitute? Maybe she needed money. Okay? But there's another high-end prostitution called escort services. Have you heard of that? Uh, sometimes women who go to college, but they want powerful, to be around powerful position, want to know powerful men. So they exchange things for money. Uh, politicians, uh, athletes, music stars, movie stars, Hollywood, that's all entangled. That's all enmeshed. And sometimes the women will offer these services. I, I, I often think like nobody grew up, no little girl grows up thinking I'm going to be a prostitute. But how do they get there? Different reasons. And we don't know what happened to this one. But we know that these two spies were godly men who made an impression on her and she opened up to them about her fears. And she's telling her, them, them the secret of the city. What's the state? 
See, prostitutes know the state of the community because they see these high governors and, and politicians and generals and soldiers, and they all do pillow talk. They all are talking. So she's, the, she's like the Twitter of, the, <laughs> of Jericho, you know? And her house is by the gates, so she knows exactly what's happening. So I don't think she's a victim here. I don't think Rahab is a victim. And that's why the Bible keeps reminding us that she is a prostitute. But after doing this business, shameful business, um, she has a conversation with godly man. And that's where she exercises her faith. Obviously, we're speculating, but she says that she believes in this God. How many of you know God can find you anywhere? Right. Maybe the reason they entered her house because God had an assignment. See, there's nobody who is too low for God to reach and to save. There's nobody in this city, in this world, who Christ cannot redeem. Come on, somebody. And uh, I'm not ready to go and rescue prostitutes. I got to let you know that. And maybe some of you are not, but maybe we can support people who are. And there are some good ministries that are going and rescuing people. But they can't just pull them out. They have to start a conversation. And here's the clue. Because they were honorable, she listened. If they were just like every other man that came to her house, she would not have listened. She would got paid and tell them to leave. But because they were different, she listened. And if they abused her, if they used her, if they made her feel disgusting, she would have easily turned them in to the soldiers of the king who sent to get them. But because they were honorable, she hid them and covered them and even lied for them and distracted the soldiers, tell them to go look for them where they were not. And they went the opposite way to escape. Because God is in a business of rescuing people. God is in a business. And we say New Life Church is a rescue ship, not a cruise ship. We're here not for perfect people. We're here for everybody, the broken people. We're like the hospital, okay? In the hospital, you have a lot of broken people. Or you have doctors and nurses who serve and help these broken people recover. So you're in two categories here. You're either those who are rescuing or those who are being rescued. You are either those who are healthy already and helping the sick, or you are the sick being helped. So how did this woman become a hero of faith? Number one, if you're writing this down, she went against her culture. I'm sure her culture had gods and idols to believe in. But when she discovered a God who's higher, she didn't say, no, 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 I'm going to be believing in my culture. I'm all about my culture. This is how we do it in my culture. We'll add Jesus too, but it's my culture. No, she said, I found most high God, the supreme God, and I'm going to serve him. I've heard actually from people who are into witchcraft, who are actually into Satanism, who say, yeah, maybe God is higher, but I hate him, and so I'm going to serve Satan. It's like, come on. If, if I found out that my, the God I serve, I hope you as well, if you found out the God you serve is like a middleman, <laughs> you know, or like a rebel one, I'd be like, no, I don't want to serve you. Let me go serve the higher one. That's what she did. When she encountered the miracles and the power of God, and how did she saw it? Well, she saw people who had no weapons, no war machinery, and here they are walking through the Red Sea as on dry land, destroying this powerful nation called Egypt without one flink of a sword, destroying Og and this other guy 
these kings, the powerful kings, and they're a bunch of nobodies who live in a de desert. They don't have the superpower status, and here they are standing against superpower. That's right. They don't have their travelers. And she says, but your God is the supreme God. So now I know it's your God. And so today, if you have not yet surrendered or confessed Jesus as your Lord, you have to do that. You have to say, I believe in you. You are the creator of the universe. You are the supreme God. You died for my sins. Romans chapter uh, 10 verse 9 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I saw reading this story that this woman made a declaration that your God is a supreme God. Please don't destroy me. Save me. And I want to be a part of this. She was a woman of faith and she cared for her family as well. And when the army came and walked around Jericho for seven days, and when miraculously, without one war machine, the walls of Jericho, which were giant, you could ride a chariot on top of them, okay, fell down. But her house, which was in the wall, the only place where the wall didn't collapse and killed everybody was where she lived. Because she believed in this God. No matter where you are, how deep in it you are, you're not too far for Christ to reach down and touch you. Never give up. Never give up. I know there's a, an enemy who says you, you've done some dirty things, you've done some bad things, you've been into some, you know... Evil things. Uh, I've had people, men come to me and say, I paid for an abortion. Uh, I don't know. I, I, it just bothers me. And I said, have you repented? Have you believed in Christ? And they said, yes. I said, then, then you need to accept his forgiveness because no matter what you've done, if you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And so she made a confession. She turned against their culture and turned to the kingdom. She made a declaration of faith. And she demonstrated her faith by works. What was her works? It wasn't just talk. She actually hid the people, the spies, man of God. And she put a red um, cloth so her house could be saved. And so today, I hope this message will encourage you that faith is powerful enough. Listen to me. Not just to get you money. <laughs> Not just to make you blessed in life. Not just to help you start a business. But to pull you out from the most deepest septic tanks from the most deepest sinfulness of your life. Later we read that Israel takes Jericho. This woman gets rescued and her family. They become believers in God. She marries, I believe, one of the spies. Can you believe it? <laughs> she marries one of the spies. They have a son. Do you know what his name is? Boaz. Who was married to who? Right. Ruth. So Boaz is mama. It's Rahab. Boaz has a son and then a son named Jesse. And Jesse is the father of King David. To whom God said on your throne. Out of your loins will come. Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And to his kingdom, there will be no end. Whew. That's a lot. That is amazing. Man, God, do you have any standards to rescue people? No, he will go to the deepest depth. But can you believe? 
And so today, I don't know what condemnation you're living under, what guilt you're living under, but if you can believe in God, He can set you free. Amen. He can put you on a new path. He can change your life and he can make your mess into a great story, into a great testimony. She changed by believing. She made such big ripple effect that she changed the history of the world. And then I read Matthew chapter 1. I don't know if you've ever started reading New Testament. It talks about Abraham and he begot Isaac and Isaac begot Jacob. And it talks about all these men having babies. <laughs> it does. Right? And then it gets to a man and it says, And he was married to Rahab the prostitute. She's still mentioned again. And then Hebrews again, and then book of James, I think, again. Your faith can make a ripple effect for eternity. When you throw a stone in the water, it makes a temporary effect. If you throw faith in this world, Maybe not in your generation. She probably didn't see a lot in her generation. She only did that one thing. That's all she's known for. See, a lot of times we think we're supposed to be like the whole Bible. Like constantly we're supposed to have miracles. Like Hannah, who had Samuel, what else did she do? She just had Samuel and then she had other children. See, we read the Bible and we want those miracles in our life constantly, every day. And if it doesn't happen, we're like, oh, I don't believe in God. Look at the Bible. Why isn't that happening? Hold on. You might be called just to do one thing in this world. Moms, you might be just called to have one baby. Who's going to be the president? Who's going to change the world? Who's going to be a businessman? Who's going to be a... a see? But what makes life exciting is waking up every morning with faith. And so today I so encourage you to exercise faith every day. Exercise it for your business, young man. Mom, exercise it for your children when you wake up. Don't dread getting out of bed because bad things are going to happen. They will. But when you wake up in faith, the devil flees. Faith is better than coffee in the morning. Oh, we should put that on social media. Waking up, drinking faith in the morning is better. I love coffee or your Diet Coke, whatever. That's awesome. We, we have a bunch of that. But faith is better than Red Bull that gives you wings because faith gives you big wings. Hallelujah. It can move mountains. And if you, chew, if you commit, your prayers will be different because you'll pray like this. God, I know this situation. I pray for it. Please cover it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Done. Not like, oh God. God doesn't respond to those kind of... God does not respond to fear prayers. Stop. Church people, thank you. Stop whining to God. God responds to faith. The prayer of faith will heal. Your faith has made you whole. Faith is a doorway for God's power to, be, to come in into your world. And so many Christians, we got the Bible, but we're such a... You of little faith. And I, I talk to myself. I'm not convicting anybody. I'm just encouraging to rise up. Because I hope this series will produce something in you. If you could get up tomorrow morning and say, come on. Fa uh, problems are only making me a champion. And uh, you know what I do when I encounter? I, I, I'll give you another secret. And that's it. You got to have theme music when you're facing a battle. Okay? <laughs> True. You got to have a music playing in your head. I, it, it helps so much. You either have a worship song. This is how I fight my battles. So let's say, moms, you got bad news about your child. He did something. Smoke weed behind the school or something, you know, uh, with his best friend. And you're like, oh my goodness, they're going to kick him out, right? Something like that. You turn the music on. For me, it's Narnia. Theme song. You know Narnia? 
oh my goodness, when they go into that battle with a white witch and, you know, there's bears fighting and lions and, and these dragons flying and, I mean, the Narnia music, it's amazing. And so I play it and, and that encourages me and I'm like, okay, this is just another battle. Because I face battles just like you and you face battle just like me. You have to have a theme song. Maybe you could, whenever you have, you feel under attack, do you have a song you play? Because song does something to the soul. I don't know, it opens the door, it cracks the door open a little bit and you, and, and then you start listening to that either in your mind or really in your headphones and then you're like, okay, I can do all things through Christ. Uh, all things work together for good for them who love God and are called according to His purpose. Get a theme song. I don't know what your theme song is. Maybe it's Pirates of Caribbean. <laughs> you know. And then you're like, yeah, we're going to kill some, I don't know, <laughs> demons or something. And obviously we don't kill demons or anything, but, but this is how we resist. Resist the devil and he will flee. And you resist him in faith. No matter how bad it is. Cancer. Oh, that's it. It's over. No. Theme music. This is a battle, we're going to fight and we're going to win in this life or in the next one, but we are going to win. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's my message. I'm over time. Did you enjoy it? Please stand to your feet. If you need to confess Jesus as Lord, you need to do it right there. You need to say, God, I, I, I trust you with my life. You are supreme over all. You're my created, creator. I trust in you. If you're battling with fear today, you make a commitment right now in prayer. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. I'm going to conquer all my fears. And you're going to help me. If you don't know where you're going, if you don't know the direction, God is the lamp unto your feet. God's Word is the lamp unto your feet and light unto your path. Your path. Declare over your life that God is lighting up your path. He will open to you the doors that you need to go through in the name of Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for teaching us the secrets of the kingdom, Lord. The world doesn't get this, but your people get that and they could live in it and they can prosper, God, and they could be fruitful in this life and in this world, Lord, because that's what you want, fruitfulness from our lives, Lord. Let us fight the battles of faith more effectively. Give us the keys and the tools of how we win these battles. Because most of our battles is in our minds. Most of our battles are in our minds, Lord. And let us overcome with our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Your faith. I'm an overcomer. Say it. I am an overcomer. I am an overcomer. I am victorious through Christ. I can do all things. Nothing will separate me from His love. I can do it with Christ who gives me strength. And I believe it and that settles it. That's it. It's done. Amen. 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 Clap your hands. Thanks for tuning in to New Life Sermon Series Online. If you're blessed by these messages and are interested in helping spread the Word of God to others, make an investment today. You can give at newlifechurchsf.org. If you have a story or a testimony to share, let us know on our website as well. We hope you have a blessed day and enjoy today's message by Pastor Alex.